When did you first start listening to Roy Eldridge? Down South? Or, yeah, I guess Down South. South right? Island, on yeah. radio or on Yeah, on radio, some from the Savoy Ballroom with Teddy Hill. I picked him out, and I've been a fan of his ever since. Well, when Dizzy said that he heard uh, Roy on the radio, I thought, well, so did I. And he was describing the radio, and I had one that looked just like it. That's a many, many years. That's like 1931, 32, 32. But I think I caught up with Roy in 34 or something like that. Back as far as his early teens, Roy Eldridge was galvanizing everybody who heard of him. Even Count Basie said he was the most outstanding trumpet player I'd heard in my whole life. Roy was only 16 at the time. You see, we'll be, uh, we'll be together. Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Shavers, Clark Terry, and Maynard Ferguson, they all wanted to play like Roy, to say nothing of the sidemen and all the big bands. I think everybody in music admired Roy enormously. As a matter of fact, it happened in my own family. Shorty Chirac had been playing jazz solos with a string of big bands, and then he heard Roy Eldridge, and nothing was the same after that. Norman Granz, the jazz of the Philharmonic impresario, said he especially liked Roy, because he said Roy was always taking chances. Shorty not only tried to sound like Roy, but he uh, wanted to dress like him. He got the same car that Roy drove, a dashing convertible. And he was on the first jazz of the Philharmonic, and people who hear that recording, some of them think it's Roy. One of the Russian journalists asked Norman, who is your favorite jazz musician, the most daring jazz musician? And Oscar Peterson whispered to him, Art Tatum. He said, no, not Art Tatum, Roy Eldridge. Listen, I was a Roy Eldridge fan too, and that's how we got together, Shorty and I. We, we met at Roy's feet listening to him. Uh, he was up on a platform at a bar called the Capitol in Chicago, and the bar kind of surrounded this platform, and Roy was up there, and we were looking at him and admiring him. And uh, I always said if there was going to be a flower girl at our wedding, Roy should have that honor. And there was always that excitement. When, when you heard Roy, the crackling sound that he, that he got out of the trumpet, he, um, they're all very competitive, but maybe Roy more than anybody else. He always had to win, that was his whole thing. And he was always seeking new people on which to pounce. Even Dizzy, his great admirer, deplored this whole thing. The young trumpeters, they were playing gentlemanly, and then Roy would take out his horn and start on a high B flat. I'm getting all this out of the Chilton book, by the way. One night, we were standing outside a club, and Roy said, come on, let's blow. And I told him, this is, this is Dizzy talking, I told him, Roy, would you mind if I went in by myself and played a while first? Because when you get to play, you don't know how to act. Roy once told me a story. When he, had a, he was a kid in a kid band in Pittsburgh, and, and they, they knew only a few chords, but they improvised with a lot of fire. And they got hired once for some really good bread for them, some kind of show. And when they showed up just before the curtain rose, they saw sheet music in front of them. And none of them could read music. So I said, what'd you do? He said, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> On a tour in England, he got into a series of rows, one with Vic Dickinson and another with oh, Bud Freeman. Oh, that's so crazy. <laughs> the most unlike, most uncompetitive people. Um, and uh, then one that uh, Buck Clayton had to break up because it was with the tour manager and it was during a BBC telecast that they were all performing on. Roy and I did play a lot through the years. In fact, we used to do club dates of all things out in Long Island. Did he come on your uh, radio show? R Roy came on my radio show, uh -huh. played piano, sang. Oh. Um, just a wonderful guy. As the years went by, he did begin to mellow, thank heavens, because uh, it was getting impossible. Great memories of Roy, That's nice. playing at Jimmy Ryan's. I think he spent the rest of his life playing at Ryan's, which featured Dixieland music. Now, he would have deplored that. The earlier Roy would have, been, would have sneered at Dixieland music. But it was like the Peaceable Kingdom. He kind of made his peace with the Dixielanders. He learned some of their tunes. They were happy to hear him, so it did have a kind of an agreeable ending. He's some great trumpet player. Wow. And Monk is in the picture, Thelonious Monk. <laughs> you had some dealings with him. Yes, well, Monk was one of my favorite uh, people. I adore Thelonious. He's one of the greatest musicians that, uh, one of the musicians that really affected me um, musically. 
more than I knew at the time. I didn't really accept the fact of Monk being a genius until after about five years. Mm -hmm. I knew he was strange when things, a guy would, wouldn't come out of his house for two weeks at a time. Right. Wouldn't come out of his room for two weeks at a time. Uh, but Monk was just being himself. That's why I loved him so much. But behind that facade was a man full of humor. Really. Really. I remember the first time I went to Monk's place to rehearse some music. Things in there, like an upright piano and a yeah. bed. The room was so small, and after those two, those two big articles, there was nothing else you could do. <laughs> and I sat on the couch, and I was tired of rehearsing. I happened to look up like this. <coughs> <coughs> up there on the ceiling <coughs> was a picture of Billy Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> I used to go and see Monk perform regularly at the Five Spot. And if you didn't have that experience, um, you miss something very, very special. Because Monk didn't just play piano. Monk, in addition to everything else, was a showman in his own eccentric way. To me, he was a great educator, too, in the sense that the way he, he learned his music, we never rehearsed. And you can imagine what could happen with no rehearsal playing Monk's music. His music was always uh, disorientated. He would have to the ending at the beginning and the, you know, in the beginning in the middle somewhere and the body of the thing would be in, at the end, you know. He wouldn't even call the tune. I never even knew the names of these tunes. He would sit down and play the piano and the second chorus. I was supposed to play what he played the first chorus. And of course his music is not that simple. i never forget that uh, I can't think of the name of the piece that was it? It was the most intricate thing I had played. So of course I'm making mistakes and he would stop and do it again. The club is loaded like this. And you do it over and over and I keep making mistakes. I mean, one note or this note or something rhythmic or whatever. And he, all the time he's telling me the music's right there in his portfolio on the piano. I said, I said hey, take him in the music. I can read. Okay. No, no, no. It's, you lesson is better. And sometimes a whole set would go by, and we're still working on this one tune. He's just playing it. And I'm making mistakes somewhere, and he would stop and go. And I never felt embarrassed. The people loved it. There it is. Muck was atmospheric. I remember there's a club next to the Savoy on the second floor. And we were up there, Monk hadn't come in yet, and the place was packed. When Monk hit the door downstairs, it was like a rumble. It's Monk, it's Monk, it's Monk, there he is, there he is, there he is. Wow. It's Monk, it's Monk. And when he got up there and started playing, it all come together. He was a man for temples. Yeah. I learned a lot about that from him. Uh, I would rather have gotten into the tune so I could solo some, because I was there to solo. I wanted to play, you know. But uh, that's the way he was, you know. It's, that was Thelonious. You always include Thelonious music in all your programs. I am now more so than ever, it seems, because uh, I'm, I'm playing tunes that I never played with him, Just do that, again and that the younger musicians like, you know, to work with me. Kenny Washington, Michael Weiss, and Dennis Irwin, you know, because they want to learn all the music. They know it already. They've been listening to it, so they want me to play it. So, you know, they bring me the parts, so or we listen to it and, and do them. <laughs> Mary Lou was more coming out of the Chicago and Earl Hines style and developing her own style. Was, she was multi-talented, arranger, composer. She was a teacher. She was always a teacher. But she was really not a stride pianist. Uh, her expertise was a more individual. Well, the thing about Mary Lou was she moved along with the times. Here she started out with this wonderful down-swinging music with Andy Kirk, but by the time that uh, these musicians were talking about, she was listening to bebop and writing a lot of modern stuff. This is actually uh, Dizzy Gillespie, who is working on uh, In the Land of Uba Day with her. Let that go. 
It was sort of a bebop think tank, I guess. Up a there, bebop right? think tank, yeah. yeah, wonderful. And she ultimately wound up down at uh, Duke University as the artist in residence. Now, um, the usual stay there, I think, for the artist in residence was probably up to two years. But her classes were so popular that they kept her on for nine years. Just throngs of kids would come in and sit in and listen. But as she was analyzing music for the class, she seemed only to like the upbeat stuff. That was her feeling about music. So when they'd get to some kind of moody Ellington piece or something, she didn't want to analyze that. So her great friend and mentor and companion and spiritual advisor, a young man named Peter O'Brien, Father Peter O'Brien, a Jesuit priest, he would take over and he would talk about the Ellington stuff. He was devoted to her and had been interested in all kinds of music from an early age. As a matter of fact, his, at his ordination, Mabel Mercer sang at a very unusual ordination of a young priest. This is a rosary. They were great companions, and she relied on him to keep her going. She wrote very inspirational stuff for the church. She had become a very devout Catholic. When she became born again, she tried to convert me and everybody yeah. else she met. You, you know, Mary Lou wrote, a religious, a religious mass, the mass, yeah, and we played it in Newport. And her mass was very lively. They played it uh, at St. Patrick's Cathedral when she died. Dizzy played it, and choruses of little children, and it was all the celebration, and that's what her music was like. That was the highlight of the mass. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah, it was nice. Some of the people that played were, um, I think Hazel Scott got well, Hazel Scott was there, but I think it was Rose Murphy who got up and sang, I can't even do this because I, I get choked up. She sang, <laughs> she sang, it's just, it's, um, it's, she sang Mary Lou, I love you. Was... Peter O'Brien was so distraught at Mary Lou's death to think that she wouldn't be around to continue this wonderful work that he set about collecting all the material he could about her. She had made some very important recordings, these suites that she wrote with various movements. She had limitless energy and just wrote all the time and everything was just deathless. Some of the compositions that had not been recorded, he got those done by representative musicians, got them on record. She saved everything. So, I mean, he, he practically has laundry lists, literally. He has menus from places where she played, all kinds of clippings, and objects, things. They're all collected out in Rutgers at the Institute for Jazz Study. Dresses of hers. Um, it's, it's a marvelous, marvelous archive. It was a toss-up between the Smithsonian, who wanted the stuff, and Rutgers, but I think he figured that uh, the Smithsonian is so vast and there's so much stuff there, and Rutgers had just gotten a big grant, so everything is temperature controlled. It's a, it's a beautiful display of everything about Mary Lou, so he's keeping her flame alive. Coleman Hawkins, whom I had worked with previously on 52nd Street and also some club dates. I worked with Coleman Hawkins. Played some gigs with Hawk. And he's the old man Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins, who needs no introduction. Well, of course everyone knew Coleman Hawkins. He showed great interest in music as a baby, and they started him informally on piano lessons when he was about five, and he was doing so well, they got him on cello, and finally he discovered the saxophone himself. Everybody acknowledges his greatness, but I like what Gary Giddens said in his book, Visions of Jazz. He writes, the first time he heard Hawkins in person, he said, I fully expected to see a god, and I did. Uh, Coleman Hawkins was in the tradition of the tenor saxophonist who had, like Chu Berry, who had this great, big, big, beautiful round tone. When he was barely 16, Hawkins was picked up by an act that featured Mamie Smith, a famous blues singer. A lot of people heard him and thought he was wonderful, including Fletcher Henderson. A lot of these bands at that time were just recording orchestras. They didn't play in places as much as lots and lots of recordings. So Fletcher used him on quite a few record dates. Years later, Leonard Feather interviewed him for a regular feature that he had in one of the jazz magazines in which he would select a star, then pick out a bunch of records that might inspire some reaction from the star. And very often they'd say, oh, that's terrible, and then it turned out to be something by their best friend, and that was considered very funny. Anyway, he played this record for Hawkins, and Hawkins listened intently, and he guessed that it might be Henderson. 
Then he spotted Louis Armstrong, who was on the date, and then Buster Bailey. And finally, that's me. It's hard to look back and think you ever sounded like that. He said, I thought I was playing all right at that time, too, but it sounds awful to me now. I'm ashamed of it. I mean, everybody else at the time thought it was just sensational. Louis Armstrong moved on after that early recording, so Rex Stewart took his place. And Rex was fascinated by Coleman Hawkins. He just thought he was so wonderful. And Rex commented on his huge appetite and how he ate so much food. He said, that must be the secret of his energy. And of course, Rex tried to copy that. But of course, Coleman Hawkins played that, that body and soul classic solo. Chilton says in his book, the Song of the Hawk, he calls this record, Body and Soul, he says, the most perfectly conceived and executed example of jazz tenor sax playing ever recorded. He calls it a masterpiece that showed him at his best, harmonically, rhythmically, technically, the apotheosis of his entire career. To Gary Giddens, it became the single most acclaimed improvisation in the first hundred years of jazz. I mean, it was a shot heard around the world. Well, it was in Downbeat or someplace, I don't know. It took two issues to get all the notes in, but uh, I think it was in September and October or something. So then all the tenor players decided to try and play it. I was playing saxophone, I, I played on my clarinet. Every prominent tenor man, Lester Young, Ben Webster, Dexter Gordon, Stan Getz, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, they've all had a go at it. Every place that Hawkins went, of course, people were dying to hear it. He was getting a little sick of it, and he was trying, gee, do I have to play it? And of course, people were dying. They wanted it just the way it was on the record. He wanted to vary it. So he began eliminating it a little bit, didn't play it every night. But then he was at the hospital all day because his wife was having their first baby. So uh, one of the musicians got on the microphone and said, Coleman Hawkins will be here soon, so we'll just play a little something. And in came Hawkins at that moment. So they said, what do you want to play? He said, I'll play Body and Soul. Uh, I'd already met Maxine Sullivan through her husband, Cliff Jackson, who was another stride pianist and a close friend. Maxine Sullivan. Maxine was a perfect singer. She could swing, she had a jazz feeling. Everything was in place. She was in tune, she had lovely rhythm. She was just ideal. And oddly enough, as the years went by, she got better. She was just great, and at that time, I was working on 52nd Street at the Onyx Club for Joe Hellbacher. That was Joe Hellbach. He ran the Onyx Club. He had founded it during Prohibition to have a place for musicians to hang out. Claude was around there. Claude Thornhill. And I told uh, Joe there's a marvelous singer, Maxine Sullivan, and he brought her in. When Joe heard Maxine, he knew she was perfect and he hired her for the club. That's how she, she came to New York. Claude Thornhill came in and heard her, and she recorded with his band. Well, it took off. That record was Lock Loman. Of course, she would have been famous without me, uh, you know, doing that thing. But that was just so happened that uh, she came in, 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 to, to New York and recorded with Claude. Uh, Cliff Jackson had been married five times before and was a real character. Uh, and they lived, they owned a building I think she owned the building at 818 Ritter Place in the Bronx. It used to take three IRT subways to get there. And uh, she was a very quiet person, and uh, Cliff liked to drink. Was, they'd give you a tour of their house, and uh, he'd open these little doors, and there would be a special label, Old Jackson Vodka, and he'd take a nip, and then he'd go up to the second floor, and there'd be another little cupboard. He'd pick out, He'd open this cupboard, take a nip out of a bottle that was in some special thing. By the time he got to the top floor, he was feeling no pain. And she never reacted to all of this. By the time Prohibition was repealed, Joe Hellbach was featuring groups like Stuff Smith and uh, the Spirits of Rhythm. And that's where Maxine encountered Buster Bailey and uh, John Kirby. Well, you know she was married to John Kirby. Uh, Willie told him. Willie gave me all of this sort of information. So the second husband, John Kirby, rounded up some of the best musicians in town and formed what he called the biggest little band. But this band was hot and Maxine sang with the band and they even had a wonderful radio program, a series they called it Flow Gently Sweet Rhythm. And on that program were featured these strange songs, folk songs like If I Had a Ribbon Bow to Tie My Hair. I think the songwriters were holding out for more money from the networks, but the ingenious people seemed to find good stuff and Maxine was in her element. I heard her recently on a TV show 
with Roy Eldridge's group and uh, Van Johnson and June Allison. It was sort of like from the oh, old yeah. days. Swing I think it was from Ro Roseland Ballroom. But she was singing great up until the day she died. She, she knocked me out out of everybody on yeah. the whole show. She was really fantastic. I heard her just weeks before she died. No kidding. And she was wearing, she had a wig on, so we knew that there's something, you know, probably that was, when they take those treatments, the hair goes. Oh. But she was still singing excellently. She was great. She was great. I, I'd, I'd heard of course, but that on that show, she sounded better than any, and they had a gang of people on that show. Yeah. Maxine Sullivan, she really was great. When I look at this picture, I'm amazed to see all of these innovators. To begin with piano, there was Lucky Roberts. This is a magnificent man that, that wrote some beautiful music, and nobody mentions anything about Lucky Roberts. He was, he was, a, uh, well, he was a Lester Lennon of his day. He could do a, f a thing on the piano where he was, he would uh, do the thing like this and keep the same, keep the same no, keep the same note going, but use different fingers and sustain a tone. You know, but he would keep it. I don't know, I can't very well tell you, but anyway, that's the way he used to do it. He was a magnificent pianist. Uh, yeah, he was wonderful. And composer. He claimed to have taught George Gershwin. He had a run that he could do on the piano that he said became the uh, clarinet glissando at the beginning of uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Lucky Roberts used to have a bar up on 149th Street in St. Nicholas Avenue, Lucky's. Did he play there? He played there, I believe, because I grew up sort of around the corner from there. So I was too young to actually go into Lucky's, but we knew about it and we saw it and we heard that a lot of these great jazz uh, pianists would go in there and play. When I met him, I would visit him at this wonderful apartment he had on uh, 141st Street and Convent Avenue. He lived on the fifth floor and he had this incredible collection of World War I and pre-World War I furniture because he had lived there for so long. I remember he had a jade lamp that was a floor lamp. It was huge. It was, it was probably six feet tall and in the center uh, two and a, three feet wide. Then that was the base. <laughs> I remember him telling me about how to protect myself if somebody was coming to wanted to attack me and thing. He said, go stand up against the wall and let them come to you. Then you got a better chance. And I, I remember that, and I have to, years later, I had to use that sort of technique in order to survive. Lucky and I played piano together in, uh, for the veterans. There was, a, there was a program called the Bedside Network that was organized by uh, entertainment people, and they would go into veterans' hospitals and play for these uh, poor people who were under heavy sedation. They were mental patients. They'd lock, the, they'd lock us into these uh, wards, and we'd play piano. And once a week, uh, Lucky Roberts and I would go to uh, these different veterans hospitals. It was just wonderful being with him. He was a fountain of uh, history. He was the first black band leader to have bands that would play for white society. All I know about Lucky Roberts, he used to offer me some very good gigs, you know. He played for the Astors, the Vanderbilts, and he also had a, an orchestra that played for Vernon and Irene Castle. Slight correction, Lucky Roberts did not play for the dance team, Vernon and Irene Castle. That uh, orchestra leader was James Reese Europe, and this was before World War I. Lucky Roberts did indeed play for Irene when she was married to a man named Major McLaughlin out in Lake Forest, Illinois. And after Major McLaughlin died, Irene married my father, George Enzinger. He played for all of the very exclusive clubs and all of the exclusive parties like Les Lester Lannan plays now. I have a, a list here from his great-granddaughter, Christina Brown. He played for the wedding of Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr. and Ethel DuPont. When the Duke of Windsor came to New York, there was a series of nine balls given in his honor, and Lucky Roberts played for every one. At the time, you know, one of his gigs would last you for a couple of months, maybe, you see. Some of the other names are William Rhinelander Stewart and his beautiful wife. The name Alkenkloss in here that we know, that's Jackie Kennedy's mother's married name. Countess Dorothy DeFrasso, an international beauty and Harry Payne Whitney, another famous name, and there's a Pulitzer on the list. Well, it goes on and on. So everybody was anxious to work with uh, Lucky. I found this out later that they knew who everyone was on this picture, except me. 
The editor of this magazine, Esquire, called everyone, John Hammond, Leonard Feather, Downbeat, Metronome was still going then, Metro, no one knew who I was. And they finally decided to call Jack Crystal. He knew who I was because I used to carry Joe Jones's drums down to the Central Plaza. Like I said, it wasn't even supposed to be on the picture because Oliver Jackson and I just came to New York. We came here as tap dancers. We danced at the Apollo stage, on the Apollo stage, the Apollo Theater. Did, he, did you both plan to become drummers? Well, we were drummers at first, and we put this act together, and that's how we got to New York. We got booked, well, I guess one of the few people that ever did that, we got booked out of Detroit into the Apollo Theater at that time. And we were dancing and singing and playing the drums, but our dancing and singing was so sad, we decided well, <laughs> we'd better play the drums. Because Honey Coles told me, and a couple of other dancers later, who I met, they said, when we came to that theater, you know, because they wanted to hear these new dancers, they had never even heard of us. So all the dancers wanted to know who these new guys coming to New York, right? And Honey Coles always said, don't you know Bill Robinson danced on that stage? You sure had a lot of nerve. <laughs> they said they kept, one of the guys told me, he said, I stayed for another show. Because I thought you were gonna, I thought that little, what y'all did before was just like a little warm up. You knew it must go do something. <laughs> and not too long after that picture was taken, I had my first chance to play with Roy Eldridge. Then I played with Coleman Hawkins. And I played with Roy Eldridge and Coleman Hawkins together. And I played with Red Allen, Tyree Glenn. I played with most of the people on that picture after that was done. Joe, well, I knew Joe even before I ever came to New York. That's a come I was around him. Him and he and Cozy Cole, when they would come to Detroit, we would go see him and they would talk to us, you know. In fact, Cozy Cole, when we first started, I had our drum act in Detroit, Oliver and I, we invited him to one of our rehearsals. He was with Louis Armstrong then, when they had the Louis, when they were Hines and all of them, and they were playing a theater called the Fox Theater in Detroit. And, we, and Oliver and I went down to the stage door and asked could we see him. We didn't know him, and he came to the stage door, and we asked him would he come to see this little drum thing we had together. And he did on one of the admissions. I was, I was so impressed that this great drummer came to see two young boys practicing in some little back room. And he came and encouraged us on. And when we came to the Apollo, he was there the first show. That's the difference I find in some of those musicians and some of the musicians that are today that they really cared about what a young guy was doing. And Cozy came up to the Apollo Theater and saw our first show, came backstage, congratulated us. It's not during the time he had the school with Gene Krupa and told us we could come down there anytime we wanted to, if we had somebody we wanted to talk, you know, if we felt about talking about something or needed a friend. But Roy Eldridge and Coleman Hawkins were like my fathers though, really. They were, they raised me. <laughs> and it was uh, wonderful. Oh, Dizzy Gillespie, John, but he calls me John because my middle name is John, and of course his name is John, so we, we, we referred to each other as John, and then, we, then on the bandstand at Cab Calloway's band, they referred to me as Funk, that's like Funk from the bass. I went with Cab Calloway. Uh, 1939. I think I was the youngest guy before Dizzy came in. Now, now I got somebody that's even younger than I. And we took up a great relationship, and he was so smart, and so far advanced in harmony and, and things like that. I was full of life. I uh, could play. We were pretty good, mm, pretty good for, at that age. Uh, 22, 23, something like that. He hadn't quite acquired his style and didn't have the power to play some of the marvelous things that he's done later, but he was attempting them, and we were really amazed that he would even attempt them, like, oh, even if he missed it, we said, good heavens, for a guy to even attempt that was just great. But Cab didn't understand that. He wanted to, why can't you play this stuff like everybody else? Why you got to go shooting for the moon? Dizzy used to do some of the darndest things. A cat would be singing a ballad like, I got you yeah. under my skin, you know, and he's emoting. And Dizzy would be, would be sitting back there on the stage doing like this, like he sees somebody in the audience he knows. <laughs> and he wave, you know, and the people would start to twitter. You know, when he's singing this beautiful ballad, why are they laughing, you know? 
And then pretty soon the cab was still singing his ballad, and he'd look over at Tyree, the trumpets are on this side and the trombones are over there. And he'd look over at Tyree and act like he's gonna throw a pass, football pass. And he threw it, and Tyree would catch it, and Cozy would hit the bass drum, just <laughs> boom. They had a small group within the band called Cab Dallas. Chew Berry, Danny Barker, Cozy Cole, and yours truly. And we were known as the Cab Jivers. Cab Jivers, yeah. And we'd go up on the roof of the Cotton Club and practice and rehearse this little thing. So Dizzy came up there one day and said, hey, folk, come on up here, I want to show you this tune. He says, it was called Girl of My Dreams, I Love You. I'll show you a solo on it. I showed Funk a whole solo, and he played it like the trumpet. But the, the trumpet, uh, 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 bass players, when I, the only guy that was playing like that probably at that time was maybe Oscar Pettiford and, and Jimmy Blanton. So Dizzy showed me this solo, and it was a flatted fifth in it. And at that time, I wasn't really too familiar with a flatted fifth, fifth, fifth with it. It didn't sit too good in my ear. So every time I played the solo, two times out of three, I would miss it. And I'd look back at Dizzy in the bandstand to see how I, if I had not done it. And, I, and if I did it, Dizzy would say, great. And if I didn't do it, he'd just say, you stink. Like, like that. And this is where I, we had this great relationship uh, with this in the one time. It, it was a Sunday afternoon in Hartford, Connecticut. And we played this Girl of My Dreams, I Love You. Now the band is still sitting up there, but they're in the dark back there. You can't see them very clearly because the spotlight's on us. And when I got to this part with the flattest field. Uh, he missed a couple of notes or something like that. I missed it a mile, I'm telling you. And I looked back at Dizzy. And he looked around at me. You stink. And at that same time, someone in the band had sitting there, had a piece of water paper in their hand, and from under the bandstand, they thumped it and it landed right in the spotlight, right beside me on the stage. And Cab saw it, and it must have been, it must, he must have thought that, and he came out there and there was a spitball on the face, stage, but I didn't throw any spitball, so. Cab says, you're lying, I saw you. No, no, I did not throw the spitball that time. And that didn't set too good with Cap. So he got very angry, he said, you go away from me, I'll slap you. And this is kind of party, he says, you're not gonna do anything. And Cap turned around and hit him. He, he accused me of that, and then I said I didn't, and blah, 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 blah. And it, it, it ended up in uh, violence. Dizzy went right straight for the cab. And then he fired me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was a, probably the best move I ever made in, in music. When I really heard that modern music, was the beginning of it was with Billy, Billy Eckstein's big band when they came to Chicago in 44, I think, in the fall of 44. But Dizzy was the musical director, and Art Blakey was on drums, you know, that band, it was fantastic. And Dexter and Gene Ammons, and that was very exciting. You know, that, oh. I had been to the White House once before, so I had met Jimmy Carter then. I, I had a book for Jimmy Carter to give him for a present, see? And somebody asked me, said, where are you going? I said, I'm going, I'm going over here. I have a book for the president. He said, did you get permission to go? I said, permission, man. Say, I know what to do. <laughs> so I went over, but he didn't recognize me when I went over. Well, I'll tell you the reason for that in a minute. He didn't recognize me, so, so I, I had this book in my hands. It's a, a book called the Baha'i Administration. It has to do, do with the world government that, that, they, that they push. The Baha'is push for world government, so uh, it was about that, see? So, uh, Jimmy, he took me say, oh, thank you very much, and smiled and everything, and I shook his hand, and, and I left. But when I got on the stage, and put my horn up to my mouth and say, <laughs> and then he recognized me. I would look that, uh, look that way this way, and, 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 and I see him, and he, he wouldn't do nothing. And, and, and I'd turn around and look this way. <laughs> so he recognized me by my jaws. And, and then that's, that's how the, the, the salt peanuts came up. Dizzy and Max were duetting at the first real jazz performance that had ever been set at the White House. It was on the South Lawn. Everything was over with, and Max and I decided to play a little encore, you know, Max wrote. Max just had the cymbal. And we played one number, right in the middle of the number, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter's 
Saw peanuts, Dizzy, saw peanuts. <laughs> so, and then I made an announcement. I made an announcement that, 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 uh, that we'd play it if he would sing it. So they started to play Salt Peanuts. And he's... <laughs> and they clued Jimmy Carter in. And, of course, the lyrics to Salt Peanuts are only Salt <laughs> Peanuts, but you have to be in on the right spot. <laughs> yeah. And there was the President of the United States singing Salt Peanuts with uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Max Roach. But he, he came up on the stage and he sang it, so they had, we had a good time. Ben Webster, the great storyteller, he had studied with Leslie Young's father. And he would tell me about the times that Prez would take him on his gig, because he liked the way Ben comped on the piano, you know. Uh, and Ben would tell me about the first time that uh, they took him on a job letting him play saxophone. Of course, he was living at the house. And so they didn't have to pay him. They were feeding him and teaching him music and everything. But one time, um, Mr. Young, Mr. Young's father, uh, took him aside and so nobody could see him and gave him a quarter <laughs> for playing this gig. Lester's father, Professor Willis Young, had a troupe of Lester and his brother and sister and a lot of children and relatives. And this is where they all learned their art, touring with the family band. Now, Lester was developing this cool style, in part due to his having listened to records of Bix Beiderbecke and Frankie Trumbauer, who played the C melody saxophone. And it sounded so attractive to uh, Lester that he tried to play those same things on the tenor. The result was this new burgeoning style of his. I had just made a record for Commodore Records back in uh, 1939, I think, before the war. And I wanted Lester Young to hear this. Not to show off, but I admired his playing so much, and I wanted him to hear it, so he came in, and he said, Bud, that three little words is a bitch. Now, I was not to see him until after the war, some seven years later, and I ran into him in front of Gabler's Commodore Music Shop <laughs> before he took the opportunity to say, hello, Bud, how are you? Not having seen the man in seven years, he said, that three little words was a bitch. And he was a truly bright, funny man who went through a terrible time in the war. He'd been trying to avoid the draft because he knew he'd make a terrible soldier. He got drunk and he got high, and they asked him if he was under the influence of anything. And he was so truthful, he told them yes, and he told them everything. They said, why would you use all these abusive substances? And he said, well, you see, when you're on the road and it's so difficult and they're one-nighters and you just can't make it the next night and you've got to take something to bolster, and they banged the hammer down and they condemned him to a year in prison and a year at hard labor. Well, I mean, he was falling apart. It was just terrible. He came out so broken physically and emotionally, spiritually, in every way. But in time, he pulled himself together and made some wonderful recordings, and they were really kind of deeper and, and more introspective and more interesting. You know, I, I always loved Lester Young. I used to go out and play my little gigs on the tenor, you know, and I used to, I, you know, at first I, you know, I, I memorized all the solos. I would play his solo, then I'd play my own solo, because I, I could create on the chord changes myself, you know, so I'd, I'd play his solo first and then play, and tend to play my own stuff, you know, but with his sound, at least trying to get his sound, you know. You know, and then to be able to work with him later on, you know, was, was such a thrill and a great honor, you know, because I, I idolized him. He really enriched the English language, didn't he, with inventing all those expressions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, half of the slang we use today came from him. He invented most of that stuff, you know. Well, he probably was most famous for the use of the word cool. I said to Harry Lim, who was a friend of mine from Batavia, Java, who knew Lester Young very well, I said, what does he mean when he says cool? He said, well, you're never quite sure. He said uh, a landlord would come up the stairs and rap on uh, Lester's door, and he'd say, uh, Mr. Young, you know, I just came to remind you the rent is due, um, and I assume you have uh, intentions of paying me soon, is that right? And Lester would say, cool, my man. And the landlord goes downstairs, and he's halfway down, and he's thinking, wait a minute, did he say he would pay it or he wouldn't pay it? Yeah, yeah. And cool was only one of many. I think a lot of them are lost. Some people know, but a lot of them, I think, sort of uh, haven't really been noted, you know. Well, that may be true, but quite a few are still hanging around, and we use them every day, and we don't realize that they came from Lester Young. One, for instance, is um, I paid my dues, and I love this. This one's one of my favorites. He says, uh, letter A, and that's... Um, Come again, start at the beginning from the top. That's 
when the musicians are rehearsing and they say, go back to letter A. So Lester just says when he missed what you were saying at the beginning, letter A. That was, I kind of like that. And he used to say bells. Bells, right, right, right. Yeah, he was, he was fantastic. Well, he was such a, such a genius and such a great guy, a hell of a sense of humor. It was always kind of reverse and surprise. He'd come in and there'd be a bunch of the musicians from the Basie band sitting around and he'd say, oh, hey, he says, uh, Ernie, uh, how are you and all the ladies tonight? And they were ladies. Uh, oh, I see Lady Clayton over there. He was very in love with the idea of lady and he did dub Billie Holiday Lady Day and she in turn gave him the name Prez. They used to call Lester Red. His name wasn't Prez then, because he hadn't met Billy yet. Red? So they called him Red. Red. Yeah, Red Red. That was his Red. name, Red. Everybody called him Red till Lady Day called him Prez, and that stuck. Even after he left the Basie band, he was replaced by a tenor man who tried to play just like him, named Paul Quinoche. He was named the Vice Prez. I think of all the people that I've known in this business, he was the most original of all of the people that I know. Both of them, playing, speech, dress, whatever. You know. A very introverted guy, but not with his band members. You know, he was very open with his band members, but outside of the band members, he was very introverted kind of a guy, but a beautiful guy. Yeah, he was a great, great musician, sensitive man, and uh, uh, we all loved him a lot, you know. That's nice. Yeah. Now, strangely enough, the lion wanders off and he's not in the final shot. Hmm. See, here's where he was, right there, next to Lucky Roberts, that little short guy. Oh, See, God, there's a vacant yeah. space, oh, so he just wandered off. Maybe he went for a pint. He's sitting just off camera. Very peculiar, nobody seems to remember why. He said he had high blood pressure. On occasion, he'd say he had uh, weak ankles, or on occasion, he'd say he had uh, high blood pressure, or he felt dizzy, so he'd want to sit down. And that was always the reason at any events that he wouldn't be standing around for too long. The Lion was born in November of 1897, making him one of the two or three musicians in the photograph who were born before the 20th century. He says, uh, my correct complete name is William Henry Joseph Bonaparte Bertelhoff Smith. I first heard about Willie the Lion in the late 30s because I had a job at that point on a newspaper. I was weddings and engagements, but I persuaded them to let me write a review column about recordings. So I would frequently call Duke Ellington up and say, I have this record here about so-and-so, and what do you think? I'd ask him all these musical questions. One time I called him up and I said, there's this big craze around boogie-woogie music. No, he said, any janitor can play that kind of stuff. He said, I prefer better technique, he said like uh, Willie the Lion Smith or James P. Johnson, and that stayed in my memory. As a bride, uh, Bob Bach, when I came to New York, we noticed that the lion was playing down in the village. I said, I'm going to go up and introduce myself to him. And I said, I'm a friend of Duke Ellington's. So the lion said, oh, yes, we're old friends. My heavens, you know, Duke is one of my boys. And we had a little get-together of jazz fans. Now, we had invited a chum of Bob's who did both jazz and, and classical recordings. The Lion was supposed to be telling us the history of jazz, and he would just be playing versions of other stride players. It never seemed to get out of that one realm, and Jerry Newman would have another drink, and then he'd say, what about Art Tatum? The Lion would say, I'm coming to that. And of course, he never got there, and the evening kept wearing on, getting later and later, and people started leaving. And I noticed the sun was coming up, and I thought, good night, Bob, and I have to go to work. And it looked like it was never going to happen. How are we going to get him to go? So we sort of edged him toward the door. And uh, just as the door opened, he sank to his knees and started praying in Hebrew. I looked at Bob. I said, now what do we do? Anyway, we prevailed upon him to do the same act again in a formal recording studio. Uh, I read in the New Yorker magazine that Willie the Lion Smith, one of the remaining stride pianists, uh, was playing at uh, the Central Plaza. This was in 1955 when I was 13. And uh, my father was kind enough to take me down to hear Willie the Lion Smith. These jam sessions at the Central Plaza on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street were run by Billy Crystal's father, Jack Crystal, who ran the Commodore Music Store. Jack Crystal had a club here and I played with Willie the Lion. He was a giant with his cigar in his derby 
and I was frightened of him. He said, the lion is thirsty. I would go and get him a drink because I was amazed at him. In any case, I met and heard Willie and started to hang out with him from then on. I wanted him to teach me to play like James P. Johnson and Fats Waller. What I remember about the lion was that he had been a Shabbos goy. Really? And oh. uh, considered himself at least partly Jewish. He claimed know. to be an Indian? Well, he... And Jewish? No, what, what it was is that he and the, uh, the woman he lived with for about 30 years, and many people of that generation or background would not admit that they were Afro-American. So they would spend many, many hours telling you that they had Scottish, Irish, German, Indian, Spanish, Italian blood. They would, they would mention all of these things. His calling card had something like jazz pianist and cantor. Yeah, but what about the, the Jewish stuff on his calling card? Is an well, ordained rabbi? Uh, I have my own theories about that. He, he, uh, he said that his mother did laundry for uh, a rabbi in New Jersey. He spoke Yiddish fluently. <laughs> he would speak broken Yiddish that really didn't mean anything, but it was very funny. And he would sing a song that was uh, fake Yiddish, too. I think it was called Peace on You. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he loved to talk. Yes, he did. A lot of people believed it, I guess. You know, my father was a linguist, and so he would tell me, and say, he's saying absolute nonsense. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he had two costumes. He had several suits, uh, and he had uh, pajamas, and he didn't have any leisure clothes. It was, I, when he was home, he was in his bathrobe and his pajamas uh, throughout the whole day. And when he had to go out to a function, he would put on uh, one of these dark suits. He had a blue suit with a red vest. He liked that. He visited me once in a farm I had in upstate New York, and for the, by the, after he got there, he had his derby and his cigar and his suit, and we were out in the country. He took that off and he put on his pajamas, and he, he wouldn't get out of his pajamas for the whole weekend. He just sat, sat around, watched TV, smoking cigars. That's funny. Boy, some musicians in here give you cold chills. Sonny Rollins, oh, man. These guys. Did you listen to big bands much when you were beginning to play yourself? You um, always played with small groups. I'm mainly a small group player because uh, when I was coming up, it was just around the time of the bebop revolution. So those were the people that we kind of looked to, Bird and Dizzy, you know. Yeah. And uh, before that, I liked uh, Louis Jordan's small band. Same here. Yeah, that, that was really the group that I wanted to, you know, play like Louis and have a small band. So uh, that, and then that led into the Charlie Parker Dizzy group, I mean, that type of sound. Mm -hmm. The bands were sort of going out also. The big bands were sort of going out around that time. There weren't so many, you know. But of course, I loved Duke's band and, uh, Lunsford and all those guys, you know. You've had the most unusual life of almost anybody in this picture because you you didn't play for a while. And, and uh, could you talk a little about that? Well, um, I, that's a long story, but I always consider myself sort of a self-made musician, self-taught musician. So I always wanted to take time off and go back and get some more learning and more studying and so on. So during my career, a lot of times I was doing fairly well. I had records out and everything. But to me, I still didn't have enough going. So I would just drop out and go back and try to get myself together. And when you come back, you're more refreshed? And I feel much better when I come your back. your whole thing is to have a lot of power, I guess. You need to yeah. store up energy. Yeah. But, and energy is very important to my style of playing. Mm -hmm. Even now, we turn down as many jobs as we accept, you know. Yeah. Well, I give a lot when I play. I really play hard. I really play hard, you know, so. And you play all over the world? Yeah, we just came back from uh, Japan, and we'll be going uh, over to the south of France in a couple of uh, weeks for one engagement. Just one night we'll be coming back, and uh, you know I get around quite quite a bit. Not, not as much as Dizzy. Dizzy, oh, not just so Dizzy. Yes, yesterday now, compared to Dizzy, I mean I'm a stay-at-home, you know. But uh, 
places he's been? Yes, yeah. well, you have a lovely place to go to. Talk about uh, where you live. Well, we live upstate in a you know, very small farming town up in Columbia County. Apple farming and horses around and so on. I still have a place in New York, but uh, that's really where I can uh, get my strength back and uh, practice and write and do my work, you know. Something I've always wanted to be able to. You practice and write then, you're not just goofing off. Oh no, oh no, I'm always practicing every day. You know, you have to keep the chops up. Mm -hmm. And if you're not working, you do have to practice. If you're working every day, then you don't have to really practice as much because you're doing it. But if you're not doing it like I am, a lot of times you have to keep yourself in, in shape, you know. Uh -huh. Do you ever go to listen to other people now? Or you... Well, Gene, not too much. I've sort of gotten away from going to clubs and everything. Yeah, it's sort of hard to really do it, you know. But I'd, I'd like to because I have a lot of friends I caught uh, my friend uh, Jimmy Hamilton over here at Carlos uh, the other night. Not the other night, actually, it's about three years ago, but that shows how infrequently I go out. It seems like uh, the other night, you know. Yeah. So you're health conscious? I try to be health conscious because uh, I've seen so many of my uh, friends and buddies uh, destroy their health. There's always a question when you play music or, or paint or anything artistic, whether you should surrender your body and your health to your art. A lot of my friends do. I did it for a while. In other words, it, does, it doesn't matter to be healthy. Just, you know, you can drink, do whatever you want, as long as it made you feel good to write or to blow a horn, whatever. So that's still a problem with me. I'm still not sure whether a person should. Uh, but you're basically a strong person anyway. Some of these people are kind of frail, I guess. That, uh, well, uh, they weren't when I met them. Everybody here, and even in this picture, a lot of guys in pretty good in pretty good shape. All these wonderful people. It's really a great picture. Really great. Really great. Roy Eldridge and I are very good friends, and he, he said to me, come on, stand over here with all us hot trumpet players. And I was about to walk over there, and George Whitley says, no, you come over here and stand beside us hot Chicago guys. Max Kaminsky, George Wetling, Bud. Bud Freeman. Pee Wee. Pee Wee Russell. Buster Bailey. And Gene Krupa and Miff Moe. So we got all those Chicago jazz guys. I love Chicago. I came up there in 1928. Those days I hardly ever spoke. And George thought I came from Chicago. He never heard my terrible Boston accent. <laughs> well, when I, when I left Chicago, when I came back home in the 30s, Leo Reisman was one of the famous society bands around Boston, and he liked me. He used to call me ukulele. <laughs> he never knew my name. <laughs> but I worked for him. He had two radio shows. One was, What Is This Thing Called Love? And all I had to do was, la, 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 la. Leo liked the way I growled. So I played that. Now, I used to play it for about three or four or five bars, and then Leo would fade me. And then another program we used to play, the St. Louis Blues, and I had to go, la, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's all I had to do. One time I played a, a next note on the show, he says, don't ever <laughs> let me hear you play again. <laughs> that's the first time I heard Tommy's band. Tommy heard about me and uh, I joined the band in, in 1936. Artie had a band, he was stuck for a trumpet player, first trumpet player. So I joined Artie in 1937. And then in the 40s, I went to work for Benny Goodman. Didn't you go into the Navy? And then in 19, uh, when the war, well, well, I was playing, but Artie had a big band. I joined that big band in 41. We were playing in Providence and in, in the mission. Uh, Artie came on the stage and Pearl, uh, he said Pearl Harbor was uh, bombed. And uh, Artie recruited this band and we went into the, the Navy. Where'd you go in that band? Well, first we went to Pearl Harbor. We stayed there several months and then we, we got on the battleship of North Carolina. 
And uh, we went out to sea and bombed the islands, and that was a terrible life. And that, the bombs with nine-inch guns would move the whole battleship out of the water, and I used to lie down on the floor and just hold on. My job was to lock up these, what they call damage control. Dave Tuff and I, we managed to, we couldn't lift up the cartridge. So we both get one on the end of it and we try to put it in the, in the gun slot. See, we couldn't, we couldn't get one. Well, neither one of you is very big. Oh, one time we saw a sub, we said, don't, don't say a word. Give me the one of this stuff going off. And, uh, and then we got the water canal and we were bombed every night there. We were, We were playing all these camps. They had these camps, you know, where all these sailors and soldiers, were, they were stationed all over the, these different islands, and we'd go out and play for them. One time we played in Guadalcanal, and we got damaged red uh, signal, and uh, we had to run for our lives to go in the foxholes. Uh, and the bass player carrying his bass instrument? Oh, yes. We, just grab what you can and run. <laughs> Get in the foxhole. That wasn't the... The best time of my life, but we did it, and we played on the aircraft carrier, the Saratoga. And I don't know if you know this, but the airplanes would go on top, and they would be lowered down into where they'd hide the airplanes. So Hardy Shaw's band was on top of this floor, and we went down, and we we played for three thousand sailors and. It just so happened that we were playing a song, and I got up and I started to play, and three thousand of the guys they started cheering. You know, <laughs> how do you even talk to me? <laughs> just pick one out. Find somebody that's uh... Mingus. Ah. Okay. Uh, uh, Charlie Mingus. <laughs> Charlie Mingus. I wouldn't have recognized him. Who, in Charlie Mingus? Because I remember when he got much heavier, you know. Oh, yeah, he did, too. You're right. I'd love to see the video that we did years ago, sitting on a park bench in Perugia. If you polled any one of these people, each one would have an amusing anecdote, I'm sure, about the eccentricities of Mingus. I would get a phone call every once in a while. And on the other end, there wouldn't be a voice. There'd be some music. It would go on for five or ten minutes. It would be something he had just written. Then the voice would come on and say, so what do you think of that? Mingus was most respected as a bass player and as a composer. I miss those, those calls a lot. And one of his most enthusiastic supporters was Nat Hentoff. I mean, next to Ellington, I think, he, he, was prob he is probably the most uh, important of all the jazz composers. Eventually, the people who now do repertory orchestras are going to get to him. <clears throat> well, the longer he stays dead, the more important he becomes, and everybody wanted to be associated with him. I was talking to Charlie Mingus' wife, and she didn't know I brought Charlie Mingus to New York. You did? First band he ever played in. I'm really happy that I did get a chance to play with him at Bradley's. Really? One night, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, I can't get started as only he could play it. Was so, he easy to get along with? Oh, yes. I, well, I, of course, I didn't work in his band. Oh. But. <laughs> well, those who worked for him probably had different stories to tell, and I'm thinking particularly of the trombonist Jimmy Nepper, whose embouchure must have been ruined when Charles knocked all his teeth out. And then, can you believe, Jimmy Nepper wanted to come back and work for him. And then there's the famous Ellington episode that everybody remembers. Charles was on the band for only a night or two when a fight broke out, and uh, there was a knife involved, and it got pretty hairy. And when it was all over, um, Duke said to uh, Charles Mingus, he said, oh, my dear friend, he said, it, it, people get so excited around you. It might be convenient if you were to resign. And he made it sound so affectionate that uh, Charles had no resentment. But it was agreed that Charles could have used a little anger management. We, we had a little, like it was a little misunderstanding one time during the record day at uh, Jazz at Massey Hall. We were playing a night in Tunisia, and Mingus had played two courses or something like that. And I came in, I thought Mingus was going to play two courses, like everybody else in the money. And Mingus wanted to play a couple more courses, you know, and, and then he's. His jaws went up, and he grumbled. So, oh, 10, 15 years later, 
He called my house. And Lorraine answered the phone. He said, let me speak to Dizzy, please. This is Mangus. She said, well, he's out of town now. He said, when will he be back? She said, he said, oh, maybe next week, I think. So he said, okay, tell him when he comes back in to call, give me a ring. So, so I came back home, and I, I either I forgot or Lorraine forgot, and then Mingus called up. Lorraine? So she said, yeah. She said, who is this? She said, Mingus. He said, did, did he come, come home? She said, yeah, yeah. He said, been here a couple of days now. She said, Ding. and he raised his voice. He said, didn't you tell him that I said call me up? So Lorraine just took the phone and said, uh, yeah, uh, this is one of your crazy friends. <laughs> this is Mingus here, yeah, hollering at me on the telephone. I said, hold at you, give me that phone. I said, Mingus. I said, you holler at my wife. I didn't holler. I said, she just told me. She's a liar? He said, no, she ain't no liar, but <laughs> she, maybe she just misunderstood my voice or something. I said, man, I would kill you. So, man. And so he said, Dizzy, now look, you know I love you. You know I love Lorraine. I know uh, uh, Lorraine loves me, and I know you love me. Although, up in Toronto that time, you was going to pull my head off. <laughs> the last time I saw him was, no, not the last time, but one of the, he was already pretty far gone with Lou Gehrig's disease. At the first real jazz performance that had ever been set at the White House, it was on the South Lawn under Jimmy Carter. There had been occasions before, like, when Richard Nixon had the nerve to sit down at the piano and play a duet with Duke Ellington. But this was a whole jazz performance. There were very good people there and the like. And Carter went over and embraced Mingus. And then he said something quite remarkable for a president. He said, it's been far too long that we did not honor this music in this place. And the reason it's taken so long is that this is black music and that this is a racist country. President of the United States, not one damn newspaper picked up that, 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 that comment. Prettiest cat I ever saw. That's Billy Holiday talking about Buck Clayton's distinguished good looks. His exceptional green eyes impressed everybody on the Basie Band. They all had nicknames, and his was Cat Eye. When I met Count, and Fred's. I was on my way to join Willie Bryant here in New York, but I never heard anybody swing like they could swing. There was an opening for a trumpet player. Lips Page had just left the band, mm -hmm. and so Basie offered me the chance if I'd sit and take third trumpet. And I agreed. I didn't agree right at first. I had to think about it because. Following Lips Page is quite a job, and I didn't think I could do it. How long so, had you been playing for that? How many years? Five years. Yeah, it's not too long. No, five years is nothing. To go with Basie. Sure. That was the beginning of me, in a way, in a way it was. Buck is a very kind, wonderful man. Don't you think so? Yes. He was always very kind. You know, any time I saw him, he had this wonderful way about him. Oh, what a wonderful guy. What a wonderful player. Oh, it wasn't put on. It was just Buck's natural way. I knew him when he used to go with Sally Sears. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sally Sears. She was very prominent socially in Boston at the time. One of Buck's many female admirers, Billie Holiday included. I wish I'd known him in those days. Buck, Buck Clayton. Buck Clayton. Mm -hmm. Buck Clayton, one of my favorite swing era trumpet players. Buck Clayton's a super guy. He was a plangent trumpet player. He's, the, the, the notes were so clear and, and resounding. And he fitted right in with the Basieites. Even before his days with Basie, he'd gone to China with a band of his own and was there for two years, and that was certainly a rarity in the 1930s. Buck, uh, you know, hasn't been playing in some time. I think he had a terrible dentist, and he could not play anymore. But he could still write. He was writing forever, 
and his post-Basie years were marked by numerous trips around the world with different groups, some of which he led. He, he wrote for all of them and uh, on occasion translated the menus for people who didn't, uh, weren't at home in those countries. The last memory I have of Buck was he had a band at the Village Vanguard, his own band, playing his arrangements. And he was sitting at a corner table, sort of listening and when necessary directing, though you didn't need any directing, because they were so clear, the arrangements. And they left just the right amount of space for the players, all of whom were very good, to do their own, to contribute their own feelings to the music. But every single number was like a classic arrangement. I can almost just close my eyes like this and just pick out a number. I know it's going to be a good one because we don't have any bad ones on there. They're all good. It was just right. And the players were intergenerational. There were older guys and younger guys. And they all dug being part of the Buck Clayton band because he made it possible for them to sound the way I think they always wanted to sound. I don't like to get into the habit of writing with the piano because if I'm out in the woods somewhere, I can't write. Yeah. And I haven't used the piano for 30 or 40 years anyway. Yeah. But I check, I check it up. If I write a note, I might check it on this piano. But they're always pretty good, your notes, when you're checking. Yeah, thanks, Millie. By the time we finally connected with Art Blakey, he was sitting in this lovely penthouse, gorgeously furnished, very attractive. You guys want some tea or something to drink? He was very warm and welcoming me and the fellow I was with insisting that this chap try on his jacket and just making us feel at home offering us stuff to eat. Do you remember this at all? But I, I noticed that he seemed terribly deaf. Do you remember the day the picture was taken? Oh, this guy. Any, any, do you remember any of this, the picture being taken? I would ask because I was curious to know if anybody had to travel any distances. So he said, I have to go nowhere, that's my house. Oh, that's your house? Yes, yeah, 117 Street. Well, it turns out he lived about 20 or 30 blocks north of there, but that was an example of kind of his uh, lively imagination. I lived in Pittsburgh and went to elementary school. My name was Perrin, Arthur Perrin, and people know me. Yeah. But Miss Perrin was my mother's best friend, oh. and she was trying to take care of me. What a hell of a person. Never met a person that's wrong. Now, the stories of his childhood, I had no idea what to believe. She said, thank you so much, sister. She said, but you take this basket and give it to somebody who really needs it. It was Charles Dickens' poverty, according to him, and how neighbors would send food over. Well, Sarah, we know you got three kids. Too proud to accept it. She'd send it back. That's OK. That's nobody's business, but I'm a woman. And they'd wind up with hardly anything to eat. We had lima beans, fat back, cornbread, and buttermilk for Thanksgiving. I haven't oh. had so much pride. Oh. And, you know, I took that from her. And you got from what he said that that never say die kind of spirit of his prevailed throughout his lifetime. I didn't study that stuff. Playing drum. I was always frightful of coming off, playing drum, suddenly come off a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. I'm a musician, I'm a businessman, I don't go around signing nothing. I've always owned Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Yeah. I own it. <clears throat> and all the young ones come to me. They all come to you. Who are some of the great stars that, uh, well, we mentioned Benny Golson, Art Farmer, uh, who else? Why you keep naming them? Yeah, all right. Well, Name Marsalis. Hmm? Marsalis. Marsalis. Why you come way up to Marsalis? Way before he was before. born. There was Bats in the Bound, yes. Clifford Brown, and all them cats come out of my band. Yeah. See? Yeah. Is this one was happening? You named some yeah. Johnny Griffin. Yes. And I mean, of course, my mind went blank. I couldn't think of all these names. I've since come by a book appropriately named Hard Bop Academy by a man named Alan Golsher, so named because working for Art Blakey apparently was like attending an institution of higher learning. And so many illustrious players emerged from his orchestra. On bass, Peter Washington, Wilbur Ware, on piano, Kenny Barron, Cedar Walton, Junior Mance, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, Winton Kelly. On uh, trombone, Melva Liston, you don't see women's names too often, Slide Hampton, 
on saxophone, Don Bias, Johnny Griffin, Sahib Shihab, Hank Mobley, Branford Marsalis. These are the trumpets. Roy Hargrove, Kenny Durham, John Faddis. All oh, them guys. Yeah. They come round in band. And I had the big band, the 17 Messengers, but that was a, a financial disaster. We had to break it up. So Horace got Kenny Durham, Hank Mobley, mm -hmm. and Doug White, because and himself, he came to my house and he said, look, boo, uh, we got this band together, boo, and we can't call it the 17 Messengers, so we'll call it the Jazz Messengers. And it stuck. Yeah. I think it was uh, James Williams, the pianist. Art was evangelistic in many ways. He wanted to have the music there for the people. He felt that music should be in the communities, not just in the concert halls and bourgeois jazz clubs. If you play down to the people, they can tell. If you play it from your heart, they can tell. One of my oldest fans, I mean, name is Sarah, she's 87, and she always comes to Sweet Basil and we get to playing the show. I come down and see her and grab her and hug her and kiss her. I say, oh, Sarah, how did you enjoy the show, honey? She said, oh, Arthur, just like I had a hot shower. <laughs> And made my day, because yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. So I think that's my job, you know, to wash away the dust of everyday life. And I just teach that to the musicians. You know, you get people to smile, I don't care how sad they are. And once you start smiling, the soul begins to rejoice. Benny Golson. Oh, Benny Golson, the sweetheart, man. He's just, uh, I, I just made another record with Benny Golson. Out in the, in the Englewood Cliffs, and he was out there. Well, he was. I didn't know he thought that much about me. Well, he was a member of my, the band, but he was talking about the time he and Coltrane came to see me with the big band in Philadelphia. They were kids, and they were all, weren't old enough to get in. You know, that Benny goes is a magnificent music. What's some musicians in here give you, 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 you think I'm the, the, like, with Benny Golson want to give you cold chills. Yeah. Benny Golson and I, we hadn't become partners at this time, but we're, we look like we're partners because we're standing right next to each other. We had done a record for United Artists uh, that, that, that was originally supposed to be a record of the poll winners for that year with Bill Evans, Benny Golson, and myself. And I was going to call Benny to ask him if he would work with me, but he beat me to the punch and he called me first. So I said, well, I was just getting ready to call you. And so we started a group called the Jazz Tet at that time. And we worked with the Jazz Tet for around four years. And then we, we dropped that and I went to Europe eventually and Benny went to California. I laugh about this. My nest egg fell like an elevator out of control. <laughs> and I wondered, did I make a wrong decision here, you know? Oh boy, I went out there where people were saying, Benny Golson, who is he? What's he done? Where here they'd been saying, oh Benny, how are you? And, uh, but it took a couple of years, but I finally got established there and I started doing what I wanted to do, writing for film, primarily for TV though. And I wrote for a lot of good shows while I was out there. Well, he was busy out there. I mean, the number of television shows um, Ironside, It Takes a Thief, Longstreet, Mannix, MASH, Mission Impossible, Mod Squad. Well, that goes on and on. There are about six or seven feature films that music composed and arranged for. The Animals, Ray Charles, Mama Cass Elliot, Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie, Carmen McRae, The Monkees, Oscar Peterson, Mickey Rooney, Diana Ross and Nancy Wilson. Economics was playing such a part in it. Oh, I mean, they would watch the clock. We would record. Somebody would make a clam. And I'd say, oh, we got to do it over again. And the guy would look at his watch contract. Oh, no, that's all right. Go on, the next cue. You know, it, I said, well, is this what it's all about? A friend of mine who had gone out before me named Oliver Nelson <laughs> died while he was working at Universal, uh, which was the busiest shop in town. And uh, they called me in to take over his sh show. And I was, as I was working on this episode, it was coming so hard. I, I guess I was getting full or, of, of whatever. I was getting enough of it, I guess. And it was so hard for me to do that show. I said to my wife, I said, you know, I think this is going to be my last show. She said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I think I've had enough of this. And sure enough, when I did that, that one episode, I told him I couldn't do anymore. I just, you know, I'd had enough. 
I was doing television commercials during that time, too. Canada Dry, Datsun, Gillette, Hills Brothers Coffee, Cool Whip, Parliament Cigarettes, Texaco. It says a partial list in each case. Then it started to dry up little by little by little. And I started to come back and just sort of flirt with playing. I would play maybe a few festivals during the summer. And then more jobs started to come. Art Farm and I met up again for some strange, I don't know how it happened, but what happened was that we decided to get the jazz tech together. So we resurrected it, brushed the dust off. Somebody from Japan called and we went to Japan. And so we started to, to sort of work again. We came to play Sweet Basil, where we'd been playing, and I said to, to my wife, if we're going to be here, we were staying with friends. We'd better get an apartment or either go back to Los Angeles. And I'll tell you, my wife is, she's, uh, well, she's not unique in this way, but she's such a supporter of me. If I were to say, I think we ought to go to East Abaddon, she would say, what time do we leave? You know? So we came back here and, and we set up housekeeping. And I must tell you, as I mentioned her, I think back to uh, 1959 when we put the jazz tet together. That was the year that we got married. So that was really the apex of my life, other than music itself. Isn't that right, Bobby? <laughs> you do say it. And I think at this point I believe it. I think so.